Hello, I'm Marty Marin, um, cardiologist. I'm head of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center at Tufts Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I have had the opportunity over about a 20 year period to manage uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and to be fortunately at a center um, that has both expertise in both invasive septal reduction therapy options for symptomatic obstructive HCM, surgical myectomy, and alcohol septal ablation. And as a cardiologist who manages patients with this disease uh, at a high volume, um, I wanted to provide and was asked to provide a perspective um, on surgical myectomy in this disease. And I thought I would start first uh, by making the point that I'm sure everybody listening to this, in this particularly in this audience, will appreciate. And one of the major advantages of surgery for this problem is that under direct visualization, real time, the surgeon is in fact able to address in a direct and definitive way all of the potential anatomical contributions to the mechanism of left ventricular alpha tract obstruction in HCF, including, of course, resection of basal hypertrophy, extending that off and down to the base of the papillary muscles to create a very wide outflow tract, addressing the often abnormal, morphologic abnormal papillary muscles, which can often be fused to each other um, multiple papillary muscles and uh, contributing to essentially pulling the plane of the mitral valve toward the septum, enabling systolic anterior motion to occur more easily. Addressing that by um, essentially uh, allowing the uh, papillary muscles more freedom to move and reorienting the, the mitral valve as a result in a more normal orientation to address abnormal connections of the cords uh, between the, the papillary muscles or mitral valve and septum. And of course, also to potentially in some patients who have elongated mitral valves to shorten that mitral valve, to stiffen it and shorten it, to decrease the chance that it will expose itself to the alpha tract velocity and create SAM. So all of this together, surger, surgery provides essentially a complete reconstruction of the left ventricle and alpha tract area to provide almost all patients the opportunity to leave the operating room with restoration of normal LV systolic pressures. And when that is done, myectomy stands out as, the, as an opportunity, a therapeutic opportunity to essentially for these patients act or represent a treatment that really reverses heart failure nearly in almost all patients. And here's evidence of that. This is our series uh, at Tufts over the last 20 years, taking again, severely symptomatic obstructive patients, operating on them with surgical myectomy and essentially converting those patients who are NYHA class three or four to essentially asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic status, 94% of them. Um, <clears throat> after successful relief of alpha tract obstruction. I know of no other therapy that can achieve that kind of improvement in symptom burden than surgical myectomy. It provides patients the opportunity to have, in a sense, their life back again. And that improvement in heart failure, which is so substantial, translates also into an improvement in mortality. Normal longevity is associated with successful surgical myectomy. And here's some Mayo Clinic data just underscoring that principle that we operate on patients here in yellow. Survival after myectomy is no different than that of an age and gender matched uh, survival of a US cohort. Again, demonstrating that outwards of 10 years and beyond, survival is excellent following surgical myectomy. Now, of course, the myectomy and also it in, in its alternative select alternative option, the alcohol separation, both procedures, in order to get those kind of outcomes I just showed, have to be done in expert high volume centers. And here's some data to sort of make that point as well. When the operation, the myectomy is done in expert surgical hands, operative mortality today is incredibly low. 
0.4%, which is significantly less than operative mortality in the United States from mitral valve replacement in cabbage, for example, many fold less than that. And of course, when the myectomy is done in less experienced hands or low volume centers, then of course, operative mortality is much higher too. But this 0.4% for, for operative mortality now really demonstrates, along with the data that I just showed you, that the myectomy is in fact a high benefit, low risk therapeutic option for symptomatic obstructive HCM. And in fact, represents today one of the safest open heart procedures that are available for patients. For all those reasons I just showed you, the recent ACC AHA expert consensus guidelines for HCM published in the fall of 2020 um, made the point that given the outcome data and the low risk associated with surgery today, that there can be patients, select patients, in whom earlier surgery should be considered. So these are patients in whom um, there's some limitation, but maybe not enough to traditionally consider them for surgery, um, who should be, in fact, thought of as an earlier candidate for surgical myectomy to help potentially alter the natural history of those patients in a different and more profound way. So for example, patients with obstructive ACM who have severe pulmonary hypertension those with left atrial enlargement with one or more episodes of symptomatic atrial fibrillation, when functional capacity is, is decreased by exercise testing, and then young patients with really high gradients for which drug therapy simply is not going to be um, uh, feasible as a, as a, as a long-term option. So all these now represent um, scenarios uh, where uh, considering patients for myectomy at an experience center um, earlier in their natural history than was considered in the past would be reasonable. Of course, what's <clears throat> been at times a debate and controversy is whether a patient who's a candidate for uh, an invasive septal reduction therapy option should have surgical myectomy or alcohol ablation. And here's some data, you know, most of, the, most of this data comparing the two procedures comes from retrospective single center experiences like this from ours. But again, sort of demonstrating consistently that um, myectomy is able to essentially obliterate gradients completely at a slightly higher frequency percentage than alcohol septal ablation, and also as a result to decrease more comprehensively the degree of mitral regurgitation that results from SAM. <clears throat> again, myectomy, again, providing more superior gradient reduction compared to alcohol self-ablation, again, relying on non-randomized retrospective observational data. Importantly too, though, the myectomy in terms of its durability is excellent. In fact, it's incredible. When you take patients with high gradients, operate on them, gradients are obliterated uh, with myectomy. Here's two month uh, echo follow-up. But then if you extend that follow-up in a large cohort of patients as seen here, for more than 10 years, so a decade after surgery, these gradients remain essentially zero, demonstrating the long-term durability of gradient reduction with surgery. Now, there really are very few, if any, head-to-head -head comparisons of, of surgery versus medical or alcohol ablation therapy, therapy uh, in symptomatic obstructive ATM, but here's some kind of comparisons across the, the board. Uh, including the uh, recent emergence of uh, new drug therapy with myosin inhibitor with Mavicamptin. This data comes from that phase three Explorer trial. Uh, my, Mavicamptin, for those that may not know, is a, is a new potent negative inotropic agent being advanced for the treatment of symptomatic obstructive HCM. And this is just uh, some data demonstrating that if you look at sort of the, the majority of studies over the decades in these therapies, you look at the percent of patients that have residual outflow gradient after intervention or therapy, not unexpectedly, beta blockers, you know, most patients have residual gradients because beta blockers are just uh, too weak at negative inotrope to really lower definitively outflow gradients. Um, Mavicamptin has about a 43% of patients with residual gradients. 
Um, and then at the other end is surgery, um, in which almost no patient with the myectomy done in an experienced hand would have a, have a residual gradient, again, because of the opportunity to intervene in such a definitive way on the abnormal left ventricular alpha tract anatomy to really restore <clears throat> that back to normal and essentially obliterate outflow gradients as demonstrated by these data. And again, that kind of translates when you're comparing alcohol ablation to surgery, that surgery, because I think of its ability really to lower gradients more than any other therapy, translates into uh, the opportunity to provide patients a slightly greater chance to really become asymptomatic after, after, our, after myectomy. And here's some data again showing you, if you compare surgery to alcohol ablation, um, more patients are restored or converted to NOHA class one from three or four with myectomy than with alcohol ablation. And, you know, it's important to realize too that, you know, one of the main things that probably comes down to today in terms of comparing surgery versus alcohol ablation is really the fact that, you know, residuals still remain higher with alcohol ablation than surgery. And those two residuals are most importantly, the need for a pacemaker, which is higher, substantially higher after alcohol ablation compared to surgery. And also the need for a repeat procedure rate because the first intervention was suboptimal is higher with alcohol ablation than, than with myectomy. Again, when both of these procedures are done, of course, in high volume expert centers. For patients, this may be a very important point. There are many patients that don't, don't want to incur a risk of having to have the uh, rest of their life a pacemaker and uh, also find uh, the fact that they may need two procedures of alcohol ablation to be um, not attractive to them either. Um, and so these are important differentiating points between the two procedures still today. And of course, surgery provides the flexibility really um, with real-time visualization, as I said, but also the opportunity to, for that reason, to address other cardiac uh, abnormalities, including coronary artery disease with bypass, uh, intrinsic mitral, intrinsic valve disease that can be addressed at the time of myectomy, um, and then again, repairing the mitral valve by shortening with plication if it's elongated, being able to really take out a lot of, uh, of, of ventricular muscle with there's massive hypertrophy, um, providing a Cox maze procedure and those with symptomatic atrial fibrillation. Of course, patients with subaortic membrane to have to have surgery since there is no other option for that <clears throat> uh, particular uh, anatomic issue. So to summarize, um, as a cardiologist, um, in position to um, manage and advise lots of patients with symptomatic obstructive HCM. Um, we have favored uh, over the last two decades, the surgical myectomy as the gold standard treatment for those patients that are ready for an invasive option to help improve their advanced heart failure due to outflow obstruction. And if I were to summarize for you that now 60 year experience with the myectomy and obstructive HCM, it would be this, that the operation provides permanent and virtual complete reduction in outflow gradients. 95% of patients who undergo surgery have a substantial reduction in heart failure over a long period of time. Most of them that's the rest of their life and associated with, as I showed you, highly favorable long-term survival. Surgery also provides the revision of, 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 of other uh, cardiac uh, not, uh, lesions, including uh, valve, uh, other subvalvular anomalies, coronary artery disease, the opportunity for maze to treat directly atrial fibrillation at the time of myectomy as well. And of course, perhaps also maybe most importantly, as I've showed, mortality now in the current cardiovascular surgical era is incredibly low when myectomy is performed in expert centers, less than 1%. And in, in, and in many of the major HCM surgical centers, that mortality is close to zero. And so this really makes the case for surgical myectomy as the definitive option to treat severe heart failure in the setting of obstructive HCM. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity um, to give this view on myectomy from a cardiologist standpoint. Thank you very much.